أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode, we spoke in detail about the fate of Banu Qurayza, the Jewish tribe that betrayed the Prophet in the middle of the Battle of Khandaq. We mentioned that one of the companions of the Prophet, the chief of the Aus, Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, he was selected to be the arbiter, he was selected to issue a verdict upon the Banu Qurayza and he ultimately gave uh, the judgment that those men who fought the Prophet ﷺ, the active fighters, are to be executed. And he basically enacted the, the judgment that is found in the Old Testament against anyone who, uh, who fights uh, against and, and commits treason. So, <clears throat> after the judgment of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, the narrations mention the historical accounts report that shortly after the Battle of Khandaq, the great Sahabi, the great companion of the Prophet, Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, he passes away. If you recall, he sustained an injury in the Battle of Khandaq, he was hit with an arrow and he never recovered from that injury and ultimately he passes away shortly after the Battle of Khandaq. Perhaps a week or two weeks after Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, he uh, perishes. There's a lengthy narration that I want to share uh, that describes how the Prophet led the funeral rites of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad. Uh, this is a very interesting narration because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he participates in a very unique way. He does things during the funeral of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad that he doesn't do with, with anyone else. The narration is found in uh, many sources. Shaykh al-Saduq in Ilal al-Shara'i' He mentions the following narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam an Abi Abdullah alayhi salam qal utiya, utiya, utiya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi faqila la the Prophet a group of people came to the Prophet and they said to him inna Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad qad mat the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was given the news that Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad had passed away. He had died from the injuries that he sustained in Khandaq. فَقَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَقَامَ أَصْحَابُهُ The Prophet immediately uh, stood up and he ordered that the body of Sa'ad is to be washed. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله was monitoring, he was supervising the, the funeral uh, the burial preparations of Sa'ad. فَلَمَّا أَنْ حُنِّطَ وَكُفٍ وَحُمِلَ عَلَى سَرِيرِ After Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad was washed, after they performed ghusl al-mayyit, after he was anointed, after he was shrouded and carried, تَبِعَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله بِلَا حِذَاءٍ وَرِدَاءٍ When they were carrying the coffin, when they were carrying the janazah of Sa'ad, the Prophet Sallallahu walked behind it. He was following the, the coffin, as we say. بِلَا حِذَاءٍ وَلَا رِدَاء The Prophet, normally he would wear his cloak. The Prophet was not wearing a cloak. He removed his cloak. And he also removed his shoes. The Prophet Sallallahu was walking barefoot behind the janazah, behind the coffin of Sa'ad. 
ثم كان يأخذ يمنة السرير مرة ويسرة السرير مرة حتى انتهى به إلى القبر. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله he also carried he carried the right side of the coffin and he would switch and he would alternate and he would carry the left side of the coffin until they reached the the cemetery until they reached Jannatul Baqi'ah. فَنَزَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله. So now we understand that the Prophet participated in the funeral. He was supervising the washing and the shrouding and the anointing. He walked behind the coffin. He actively carried the corners of the coffin. And now the Prophet ﷺ is going inside of the grave. The Prophet ﷺ, he went down into the grave. He was arranging the body, directing him towards the qibla. And you know, he created a lahad, which is kind of an opening when you go down into the, the grave. A lahad is kind of an opening that you put into the, the earth, the sides, and then you insert uh, the body. وَجَعَلَ يَقُولْ نَاوِلْنِي حَجَرًا نَاوِلْنِي تُرَابًا رَطِبًا يَسُدُّ بِهِ مَا بَيْنَ اللِّبْنِ So the Prophet ﷺ, he was asking his companions, you know, give me some stones, give me some moist soil. And the Prophet ﷺ was putting the final touches as he was uh, burying Sa'd. The narration continues and says, فَلَمَّا أَنْ فَرِغَ وَحَثَّ التُرَابَ عَلَيْهِ وَسَوَّى قَبْرًا After the Prophet put the, the dirt on his body, and the Prophet ﷺ was very meticulous in the way that he was burying Sa'd. He was making sure that everything was smooth inside of the grave. The, uh, the soil was, was smooth around the body. And perhaps some of the companions of the Prophet, they were wondering to themselves, you know, why is the Prophet uh, being such a perfectionist? Ultimately, this body is going to disintegrate. So why is the Prophet making sure that everything is in its place and everything is tidy in the in the grave. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله إني لا أعلم أنه سيبلى ويصل إليه البلاء. I know the Prophet says that the body will disintegrate. I know that this body is going to become soil and dirt. Well, and this and you you may be wondering why I'm being so meticulous. In the burial of Sa'ad. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يُحِبُّ عَبْدًا إِذَا عَمِلَ عَمَلًا فَأَحْكَمَ He says, I'm doing this because Allah loves when a servant performs an action and they excel in it, they perfect it. So even when it comes to burial, the Prophet says, if you're going to do a job, do it right, execute it, Flawlessly, if possible, do it beautifully. When the Prophet was pouring the dirt upon the grave, قالت أم سعد من جانب سعد بن معاذ, his mother was still alive. You can only imagine how painful it was for her to see her own son die during her lifetime and for him to be buried in front of her eyes. She was standing at the edge of the grave. She was looking at the grave of her son. She had witnessed the elaborate funeral rites that the Prophet ﷺ had performed. And she says to her son, she speaks to his dead body. She says, Hani لَكَ jannah." She says, O oh my son Sa'ad, have glad tidings 
have the glad tidings of paradise. In her mind, my son was the companion of the greatest messenger of God. My son fought alongside Rasulullah in battle. My son is now dying as a shaheed. He's a martyr. He's dying because of a wound in one of the battles of Islam. The Prophet led his funeral. The Prophet prayed over him. The Prophet buried him with his own hands. So she says to her son that have the glad tidings of Jannah. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ يَا أُمَّ سَعْدٍ مَهَ The Prophet says, O oh, the mother of Sa'd, he says, be silent. لَا تَجْزِمِي عَلَى رَبِّكِ The Prophet was essentially saying to her that don't speak on Allah's behalf. Don't assume that He is among the people of paradise. Don't, don't make this assumption. Don't speak on behalf of Allah. فَإِنَّ سَعْدًا قَدْ أَصَابَتْهُ ظَمَّ Because at this moment, Sa'ad is experiencing a squeezing in his grave. Yes, inshallah, he is paradise bound. But don't think that he's not going to experience any difficulties or struggles in Alam al Akhirah, in the hereafter. In fact, at this moment, he is being squeezed in his grave. The narration continues. After the funeral, some of the companions were wondering about what they had witnessed because they saw the Prophet ﷺ do things that he had never done before. The narration says, Imam al-Sadiq says, فَرَجَعَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَرَجَعَ النَّاسِ The funeral, the, the burial was finished. The Prophet goes back to uh, he goes back to his home. He goes back to um, the people go back from the cemetery. فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَقَدْ رَأَيْنَاكَ صَنَعْتَ عَلَى سَعْدٍ مَا لَمْ تَصْنَعْهُ عَلَى أَحَدٍ They say, Ya Rasool Allah, we saw you do certain things with Sa'd, with the with the in the funeral of Sa'ad, that we had not seen you do with anyone else. They say, Ya Rasulullah, we saw that in the funeral, during the funeral of Sa'ad, you were not wearing your rida, you were not wearing your cloak, and you always wear your cloak. We've seen you attend other funerals and you were wearing your cloak and we saw that you were barefoot. It's the first time that we see that you're barefoot during a funeral. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ إِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ كَانَتْ بِلَا حِذَاءٍ وَلَا رِدَاءٍ فَتَأَسَّيْتُ بِهَا The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله, he says because the angels were not wearing their cloaks now again, from this hadith, it seems that the angels also have some sort of garb, some sort of something that resembles a cloak, a, a formal type of attire. Now again, we don't know the nature of these things, but based on this hadith, the Prophet says the angels were, they had cast aside their cloaks. And they were also barefoot, meaning that it seems that the angels normally they have some type of something covering their feet, but even that was set aside. They were also barefoot and without a cloak. And the Prophet says, I was merely imitating and following the example of the Malaika. They said, Ya Rasulullah. We also saw that you were carrying the coffin of Sa'ad and you were switching between the left side and the right side. A few moments you would carry the right side of the coffin and then you would alternate and you would carry the left side. They say, why was that? The Prophet ﷺ, he says, كانت يدي في يدي جبرائيل أخذ حيث ما أخذ. The Prophet 
He says, I was following the hands of Jibra'il alayhi salam. When Jibra'il would take hold of the right side of the coffin, I would also take hold of the right side. And when he would take hold of the left side of the uh, coffin, I would take hold of the left side. I mean, this narration truly reveals the lofty status of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad that Jibra'il is carrying his janazah. فَقَالُوا أُمِرْتُ بِغَسْلِهِ وَصَلَّيْتُ عَلَى جَنَازَتِهِ وَلَحَتُّ The Prophet says, I was commanded to wash him and to pray over his body and to uh, position him in his grave. ثُمَّ قُلْتْ Uh, the, the, فقالوا, the, the narration actually says فقالوا أمرت بغسله وصليت على جنازته ولا حتى the, the Muslims they ask, the companions ask they say that you know you commanded us to wash him and to pray over his body and to position him in the grave and we heard you say يا رسول الله إن سعدا قد أصابته ضمة that it's very clear that سعد is a very unique personality that he is he's given this distinguished honor. But yet, Ya Rasulullah, we heard you say that Sa'ad is now being squeezed in his grave. You know, when his mother said, Hani al Jannah, you said to her that don't speak on Allah's behalf. Sa'ad is now being squeezed in his grave. So they, they're wondering, you know, what did Sa'ad do? That made him deserving of that squeezing in the grave. And believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, the answer that the Prophet gives sh- should give us all pause. It should be a moment of deep reflection for us. The Prophet says, Naam, yes, Sa'ad was indeed squeezed when he was placed in his grave. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فِي خُلُقِهِ مَعْ أَهْلِهِ سوء. Sa'ad was a great man. He had many virtues, many merits. But he was harsh with his family. He didn't have the best akhlaq with his wife, with his kids, with his immediate family. This narration, brothers and sisters, shows us how important it is for someone to have good akhlaq. Why? Because Sa'ad, as we mentioned, he's a companion of the Prophet. Sa'ad prayed behind Rasulullah. You know, you and I, we never had the honor of praying behind the Prophet. Sa'ad went to battle alongside the Prophet. Sa'ad achieved martyrdom. Sa'ad had the Prophet attend his funeral. The Prophet prayed over him. He buried him with his own hands. And even then, even after all that, that was not enough to repel the consequences, the negative consequences of mistreating one's own family. So this shows you, brothers and sisters, that when it comes to akhlaq, you have to have something to show for. If you have bad akhlaq, even Rasulullah cannot help you. Even the Messenger of God cannot dispel the consequences of having bad character. So this was truly a, a wake-up call for many of the companions who attended the funeral of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad. Another issue that is important for us to speak about as we discuss you know, some of the most important events uh, during the, the mid medani period, among the things that is mentioned, perhaps it took place after the Battle of Khandaq, is the marriage of Zainab bin Jahash. Now, of course, this woman uh, ultimately ends up marrying the Prophet, but before she becomes the wife of the Prophet, there's an interesting story uh, that's uh, related to her. Now, of course, just to give you some background on her marriage, her eventual marriage to the Prophet 
The Prophet Sallallahu he had an adopted son named Zayd ibn Haritha. And we spoke about Zayd ibn Haritha in our earlier episodes. He was a, a slave. Some narrations mention that uh, he was purchased and owned by Khadija and she was gifted to the Prophet after they got married. And Zayd ibn Haritha, even when his own family comes to uh, claim him, he, he preferred to stay with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet ends up freeing him and he adopts him as his own son. Of course, without denying and denying uh, his biological roots, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa takes him under his wing and he raises him as his own son. Now, as we've seen in the life of the Prophet the Prophet always emphasized that the most important criterion for status as a Muslim is taqwa. There are many verses in the Quran, the Prophet on a number of occasions he would highlight that Muslims are equal to one another. That Islam doesn't recognize, you know, uh, tribal superiority. At the end of the day, the standard for nobility is piety. Now, unfortunately, there were still many Muslims who had an an aristocratic mindset. They still had these tribal tendencies. They still looked at the world through the lens of social class, socioeconomic status. And it was still very common for people to marry within their social circles. It's very rare for someone of a high social class to marry someone of a lower social class. It's very rare that you see someone who's wealthy marrying someone who's destitute or poor. It's very rare that you see a free person marrying a slave or a former former slave, and so on. So the Prophet Sallallahu to break this cultural taboo of marrying outside your social class, the Prophet Sallallahu and as I said, there was this stigma uh, associated with a formal slave marrying a woman from you know the upper crust of society. So the Prophet Sallallahu not only is he challenging the status quo through word, but he's actually doing it through his actions. One example is that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encourages his adopted son, Zayd ibn Haritha, who is a formal, former slave. Now even though he is no longer a slave, the fact that he was a former slave means that he is he's not a person of high social status. So what does the Prophet do? The Prophet ﷺ, he encourages Zayd to propose to Zainab bin Jahash. Zainab bin Jahash is the Prophet's cousin. So here again, the Prophet is not just speaking about these issues theoretically. He's, he's a true leader in the sense that when he speaks something, he also practices it. So when he's encouraging Muslims to set aside these biases, this, the prejudice that they have towards people of different social classes, the Prophet is the first one to come forward and he's encouraging a former slave to marry his own cousin, someone from the, the, family, the extended family of the Prophet. So Rasulullah he encourages Zayd ibn Haritha to go and propose to Zainab bin Jahash. And Zainab, of course, she comes from a very noble family. Her, uh, her mother, of course, is the, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, and she's the Prophet's aunt. They, they're a very uh, well-off, well-to-do family. So the Prophet وآله, he makes the suggestion. Zayd bin Haritha expresses interest. The Prophet actually goes to propose on Zayd's behalf. So the Prophet ﷺ, he goes uh, 
to the family of Zainab bin Jahash. When he arrives, uh, the, the family, Zainab herself, they assumed that the Prophet was coming to propose to her, that he was the one who was proposing. So the assumption was that Rasulullah wants to marry Zainab bin Jahash. And she was overjoyed at the idea of being the wife of the Messenger of God. Now the Prophet he breaks the news to them that you know I'm not coming on my I'm not coming for myself. I'm not asking for her hand, but rather I'm coming on behalf. I'm here to propose on behalf of Zayd, Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, of course, Zainab's brother, some of the other relatives, they vehemently opposed the idea that ultimately they see Zainab bin Jahash as a woman who comes from a noble family. She comes from the upper crust of uh, Medina, right? So it was difficult for them to accept a suitor like Zayd ibn Haritha. So initially they refuse. They were very reluctant to, to give permission, to accept that proposal. So they, they refuse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals verse 36 of Surah Al-Ahzab. These ayat, they are related to that refusal. The Prophet is telling them that I want, I want you guys to take Zainab as a husband, accept him as the husband of uh, Zainab bin Jahash, accept his proposal, they refuse. Rasulullah is telling them that I'm, I'm telling you to accept him. They refuse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the ayah, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Allah says, it is not befitting for a believing man or a believing woman. So, so this ayah is also admonishing Zainab bin Jahash that if you guys are truly believers, it's not befitting for a believing man or a believing woman. When Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter, Allah and His Messenger have decided that Zayd bin Haritha should be should marry Zainab bin Jahash. And then the ayah says, وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا And whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger has certainly strayed into clear error. It's a sin for them to refuse. So when this ayah is revealed, Zainab and her family, of course, they felt embarrassed and they, they came to their senses. The initial shock wore off and ultimately they realized that, yes, you know, the Prophet ﷺ is giving us a command. We have to obey the Prophet. So after the revelation of this ayah of the Qur'an, Zainab and her family, they accept the proposal of Zayd ibn Haritha. The couple, they get married. The Prophet ﷺ, he conducts the marriage ceremony. Zayd and Zainab are now husband and wife. Zayd ibn Haritha, the former slave, who is one of the Muslims who has a lower social status, and Zainab bin Jahash, an aristocrat in her own right. They are now husband and wife, living under the same roof. Unfortunately, soon after their marriage, the couple started to have problems. There was a lot of conflict, a lot of dispute, a lot of fighting and arguing. And one day, Zayd, he complained to the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this woman is always arguing and fighting with me, you know, saying things that are upsetting me, belittling me, so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ, whenever Zayd would come to him, he would say to him that be patient, you know, be more tolerant, you know, uh, 
don't take don't don't be so offended and so on now the question here is why was the marriage unsuccessful there are many opinions but it seems that the most plausible of them is that it was probably very difficult for Zainab to live with Zaid you know at the end of the day they're probably both very decent human beings but it seems that she used to talk down to him you know at the end of the day she sees herself as someone coming from a noble family and maybe Zaid was not as cultured or as refined so this led to constant uh, disputing and arguing and fighting so it seems that the majority of scholars seem to believe that uh, that Zainab uh, used to be condescending in her treatment of Zayd. Now, of course, Allah knows best, but that's that's what a lot of scholars infer from uh, from these reports. So, because they came from vastly different worlds, they just weren't able to to get along and see eye to eye. Now, Zayd eventually divorces Zainab. The Prophet ﷺ insists that, you know, be patient, be tolerant, but ultimately the marriage doesn't work out. And this is possible. You know, sometimes you have people who are good, they're decent people, but they just don't get along. They have different temperaments, they have different um, different worldviews, there are certain things, there are certain pet peeves, and they're not able to resolve their conflicts. They have irreconcilable differences. This seems to be the case with Zayd and Zainab. So Zayd eventually divorces Zainab. And again, up until this point, there's no major controversy. You know, yes, it was a bit of a shock for for people to see that Zayd ibn Haritha, a former slave, had married Zainab bin Jahash, someone who comes from the upper echelons of uh, Medinan society. Yes, that was a bit of a shock, but it wasn't something that was a major controversy. What was very controversial is what happens next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 37. وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَ اللَّهُ مُبْدِي وَتَخْشَ النَّاسَ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَاهُ فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٍ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ إِذَا قَضَوْا مِنْهُنَّ وَطَرًا وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا And remember, O Muhammad, when you said to the one on whom Allah bestowed favor, meaning Zayd ibn Haritha, because Allah guided him to Islam, and you bestowed favor, meaning this is a man who was raised by the Prophet, the Prophet also bestowed a favor upon him by raising him as his own son. The Prophet said to him, keep your wife and fear Allah. Don't divorce her. Be patient. Be more tolerant. While you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. And we'll speak about what is what is meant here. What was the Prophet concealing within himself that Allah was going to expose? And you feared the people while Allah has more right that you fear Him. Now again, is Allah rebuking the Prophet? What is going on in this verse? We'll speak about that shortly. So when Zayd no longer, when Zayd had no longer any need for her, when he divorced her, basically, we married her to you in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them. And ever is the command of Allah accomplished. Now what was the Prophet concealing in his heart? Because the verse the verse clearly says, وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَ اللَّهُ مُبْدِي That Allah says, while you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. What did the Prophet conceal within himself in relation to uh, this marriage or in, in relation to Zainab bin Jahash? There is a narration where Imam As-Sajjad he explains that إِنَّ الَّذِي أَخْفَاهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ 
هو أن الله سبحانه أعلمه أنها ستكون من أزواجه. Verily what he concealed in his heart was the fact that Allah had informed him that she, that Zainab, would become one of his wives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet that Mary Zayd to Zainab bin Jahash. Their marriage is not going to work out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to wed you to her. Now this part the Prophet didn't share. The Prophet knew that this marriage was going to, was not going to last. And, Allah, and the Prophet knew that eventually Allah had commanded him to marry her. But this was not disclosed. This was not disclosed to the people. Because there was an important objective that this marriage was going to achieve. Number one is that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to break that taboo that women or men especially women who come from higher levels of society, there's no problem if they marry someone of a lower social status. And number two, and more importantly, is that your adopted son is not your biological son. And therefore, his wife is not your daughter-in-law. Because normally, in, in, in our jurisprudence, it is forbidden for the father to marry the the wife of his son, because your daughter-in-law. But in reality, Zainab bin Jahsh is not the daughter-in-law of the Prophet, because Zayd is not his son. This was a very this because this was so prevalent. The only way for this stigma to be completely dismantled is for the Prophet to take this uh, extreme course of action. Now, there are some narrations that we find in Sunni hadith literature. And again, there are, other, there are many Sunni scholars who object to these narrations. But there are some who accept them. And that is the, what we can call the love-struck narrative. There are many versions of this narration, but I'll just mention, there are many variations of this uh, story, but I'll just mention the following very quickly. Uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal in his Musnad, he narrates from Anas ibn Malik that the Prophet sallallahu he visited the house of Zayd ibn al-Haritha and he caught a glimpse of Zainab bin Jahash and something entered into him. And there are other narrations that say that he was completely bedazzled. He was love struck. It was love at first sight when the Prophet saw the uh, the face of Zainab bin Jahash. And the moment he saw her, he wanted to marry uh, Zainab. And therefore some have said that what he concealed in his heart is that he loved Zainab and he wanted to marry her. Now, there are many issues with this, with the love-struck narrative. Number one, and probably the most obvious, is that Zainab bin Jahash is the Prophet's cousin. So... It's obviously not the first time that he had seen her. So why is it that suddenly when he sees her, he's completely taken aback? There's a very high likelihood that he's seen her before. Also, if the Prophet ﷺ truly wanted to marry her, the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to ask for her hand in marriage on Zayd's behalf, the family, they were, they were interested. They already expressed their desire for the Prophet to marry Zainab bin Jahash. So if the Prophet ﷺ truly wanted to marry her, and presumably he saw her, he saw the family, he should have just married her right then and there. But again, this is probably a fabric. Most likely this is a fabricated, not just most likely. I mean, there are a lot of problems with this narration. And therefore, uh, the narrations that mention that the Prophet ﷺ was completely and utterly love-struck uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, that we do not accept. Especially because this story uh, resembles uh, the incident of, uh, of Dawood ﷺ, this uh, fabricated story of Dawood ﷺ coveting the wife of one of his, uh, his generals and sending him into uh, 
uh, the battle, the front line, so he can be killed because Dawood had seen her and he was also love struck. Again, this is not the uh, this is not behavior that is characteristic of the noble messengers and prophets of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Now, since going back to the marriage of uh, of Zainab bin Jahash, so since the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Zainab shattered a lot of cultural taboos and stigmas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to publicize this marriage. It was important for this marriage to be announced and for it to be publicly known. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after commanding uh, him to marry Zainab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also commanded the Prophet to invite many guests to his home to have what we call a walima, to have people come and have uh, the marriage, uh, the wedding feast. Now, a number of, of issues arose after the marriage of Zayd ibn Jahash, especially when you have people coming in and out of the house of the Prophet, breaking bread with the Prophet. Uh, there were some issues that required uh, divine intervention. And this is what we see mentioned in Surah uh, Al-Ahzab. Again, uh, around the same, t- uh, same time period, Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَدْخُلُوا بُيُوتَ النَّبِيِّ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْذَنَ لَكُمْ إِلَىٰ طَعَامٍ غَيْرَ نَاظِرِينَ إِنَا O you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet. Now, of course, here, houses, it doesn't mean that the Prophet you know, has this massive real estate portfolio. No, these are... Houses here means rooms, these small living quarters that belong to the wives. O you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet except when you are permitted for a meal without awaiting its readiness. So when, when, the, when the walima was announced, people started to show up even before the wedding feast was prepared. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا دُعِيتُمْ فَادْخُلُوا But when you are invited, then enter. It seems that many people were, they were too comfortable with the Prophet. They would enter his house even without asking for permission. That's how approachable, that's how down to earth the Prophet was. But many Muslims, they were taking it too far. They were not observing these important etiquettes. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا دُعِيتُمْ فَادْخُلُوا فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا and when you have eaten, when you have come, when you've broken bread with the Prophet, when you would have, when you had your meal with him, disperse. وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لحديث. And don't sit too long after you've had your meal, you know, in, in, enjoying conversations with the Prophet. إِنَّ ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِ Indeed, that behavior was troubling the Prophet. Many of the Sahaba, they would overstay their visits. They would stay for many, many hours. And this would trouble the Prophet. It would distress him. And the Prophet was too shy to dismiss you. But Allah is not shy of the truth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now giving some guidelines to the Muslims on how they should interact with the wives of the Prophet. And Allah says, and when you ask his wives for something, you know, sometimes people, they need, you know, some utensils, they might need to use some appliances, they might need some sugar, some honey, some barley. Because ultimately, the Prophet's wives were living in living quarters that were connected to the masjid. So Muslims who are coming to the masjid are able to access the wives of the Prophet. So Allah sets some very strict uh, protocols for the way that the Muslims are to engage the wives of the Prophet. And when you ask his wives for something, ask from behind a curtain, from behind a hijab. So this ayah is known as Ayatul Hijab. Now hijab is not referring to female uh, clothing, female dress code, but rather the ayah of hijab is related to the, the etiquette and the protocol with which Muslims should follow when they interact 
with the wives of the Prophet. So hijab in this ayah is not a reference to the, the hijab that we know of. Because the Quranic term for female covering is khimar and jilbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, ذَلِكُمْ أَطْحَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِنْ That is purer for your hearts and their hearts. It's purer to have this formality in your interactions with one another. وَمَا كَانَ لَكُمْ أَن تُؤْذُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَلَا أَن تَنْكِحُوا أَزْوَاجَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ أَبَدًا And it is not conceivable or lawful for you to harm the Messenger of Allah or to marry his wives after him. One of the companions of the Prophet made a comment that he was going to marry, that if the Prophet dies, he wanted to marry such and such wife. This, When, when the Prophet heard this, it, it, it upset him. It offended him deeply. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals that no one is allowed to marry the wives of the Prophet after his death. إِنَّ ذَٰلِكُمْ كَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمًا Indeed, that would be in the sight of Allah an enormity for someone to even have the audacity to say that I want to marry one of the wives of the Prophet after his death. This is a, a grievous sin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that this is absolutely forbidden until yawm al-qiyamah. None of the wives of the Prophet are allowed uh, to enter into any marriages after the death of the Prophet. Now these were some of the things that were happening uh, perhaps after the battle of Khandaq and inshallah we'll continue and we'll speak about some of the events that led up to the famous treaty of Hudaybiyyah which took place in the sixth year after the Hijrah. Inshallah we'll discuss that in detail in our next session. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا لِلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Any questions or comments? So, uh, in, in the verse, when for the Prophet went to make the proposal to uh, Zainab bint Jahash, yeah. why was the verse of the Quran reveals saying that it's not befitting for a man or a woman uh, that Allah, well, uh, like, well, especially the part where it says like they have when they have decided a matter, because it sounds like this is almost that's not really a proposal, but instead it's something that was mandated. Yeah. So as for the part of the verse where it says it is not befitting for a believing man or a believing woman, it seems that Zainab bin Jahash as well as the the male members of her family. They refused. They initially refused. Now, where Allah says, إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ When Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter, in this, in this case, it was a proposal, but at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ made it clear to them that you know, this is something that has been divinely ordained. And... This proposal is, is basically a formality of something that, that has to happen. So even though the Prophet proposed, um, technically it was, it was still uh, an obligation in this, in this specific context. I see. Um, is there any chance the divinely ordained matter was the, the uh, status disparity and just like feeling the status disparity was different or was the proposal itself Clearly, divinely ordained. No, the proposal itself, the proposal itself, the, the marriage between Zainab and uh, and Zaid was something that uh, that was uh, that was decided, and therefore, I mean, when you look at the uh, the the narrations, it was after this verse, after this verse was revealed, uh, Zainab bin Jahash and her family, they uh, they regretted what they did and they actually move forward with the with the marriage so so there was a clear understanding that this verse was a was a was a direct uh, uh, admonishment from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them refusing uh to comply with uh the orders of the prophet okay uh, thank you and and idol hijab it, it's uh interesting that it calls out that speaking to 
uh, to the wives from behind the partition is pure for both your hearts and their hearts as well. Yeah. Uh, could you kind of like talk about that a little bit? So th this also shows you that, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go to that verse, Ayatul Hijab, if you kind of juxtapose this, uh, this ayah with Ayatul Tatheer, as we mentioned in our earlier sessions, it's very clear that the wives of the Prophet they they can be susceptible to uh, to having you know uh, their hearts tainted with sinful thoughts. Whereas when you look at Ayatul Tathir, Allah says, "Inna ma yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum alritz ahl al wa yutahira kum tathira." So here, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Dalikum atharu li qulubikum wa qulubihim." That this is more pure for your hearts and for their heart, hearts. That indicates that the wives of the Prophet do not enjoy that thorough purification that is referenced in Ayatul Tatiyah. So the wives of the Prophet, yes, some of them are righteous, are more righteous than others, but ultimately they're prone to sin. They're prone to sin like any other uh, individual. Whereas the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, they are uh, they are protected, they are thoroughly purified. So that this ayah is uh, stands in contrast, in fact, to uh, to the the message of purification in uh, in Ayatul Tatiya. And in a previous class, you had shared that Ayatul or the. The part where it is not lawful for you to marry the wives of the messenger yeah. was revealed after one of the companions had indicated that he would like to marry one of the prophet's yeah. wives after he passed away. Yeah. Uh, how does that timeline line up with this verse being revealed and the marriage? How does how marriage does, to Zainab? How does this uh, this verse? Which verse? Right. Right, right. The, the verse of Ayatul Hijab, like where it says that you're not uh, allowed to marry the Prophet's wives after him. So, so you're talking about. So, I, I didn't put the verse number, but this is also from uh, from Ayatul uh, from Surah Al Hazab. So, again, the verse of Tathir, Ayatul Hijab, all of these verses are revealed roughly around the same time period. You know, it's we're talking about you know fourth, fifth sixth year after the hijra in that time period uh, these are uh, this is when these verses uh, are revealed so when we were speaking about ayatul tathir it's not that you know uh, ayatul tathir was revealed years before these verses it's roughly around uh, around the same time period okay I, I guess like my question was more along the lines of there was like another event which was referenced in in relation to this verse where one of the companions was saying that they would want to marry the prophet's wife afterwards. After he I mean, I, I don't know the particular context, but we do know that th this statement, uh, according to some reports, was mentioned by uh, was mentioned by uh, Balha in relation to Aisha. So, Aisha was married to the prophet in the, I believe, the third year after the Hijra. So it was within this time period, you know presumably third year after the hijra so between third and fifth year after the hijra is is when these when these comments are being made and it's possible that it was made on more than one occasion so i mean we, there's no there's no reason to believe that this was just you know an, an anomaly so maybe this was uh something that was expressed uh by multiple individuals on more than one occasion and hence allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know categorically uh forbids it uh 